Chapter 7 Nelda is missing. Nancy opened the corridor door an inch and looked out before admitting the caller. She was pleased to see Rod Havelock standing there. Come in, she said. The assistant purser stepped inside, closed the door, and took a ring of keys from his pocket. He walked over and greeted the other girls. I have all the keys you'll need for the adjoining cabin, he said. I suggest that you hide them until Nancy and I get back from our little excursion. Rod grinned and explained what each key was for. The one with the blue mark will open the connecting door from this cabin to 130. Beyond it, you'll find another door, which opens into the other cabin, but you can't unlock it from this side. You mean we'll have to enter cabin 130 from the corridor? Bess asked. That's right with the yellow key, and this red one opens the connecting door from 130 to 128. I suggest that you bolt the corridor door from the inside and leave the bolt in place. Then unlock the connecting door from 130 and leave it open for the rest of the trip so you can go next door without stepping into the hallway. Is that clear? It's as clear as mud, Bess giggled. Rod went on. I think all of us should know where you are going to hide the keys. Does anyone have an idea? The girls looked around and finally Nelda pointed out that there was a tiny drawer on the back wall of their wardrobe. That's a good suggestion, Rod Havelock agreed. Here, take them. He handed the keys to Nelda, who immediately put them in the hiding place. Then he said to Nancy, Let's go. He peered into the corridor and announced that no one was in sight. Come on. Nancy slipped the key to 128 into her pocket. Then the two set off. They did not rush, but walked on tiptoe to avoid calling attention to themselves. They reached the iron stairway to the boiler room and descended. The men on duty nodded to Havelock but did not ask any questions as the couple headed for the hold. Rod unlocked the heavy steel door. Then he switched on the overhead lights. I'm glad the lights were fixed, Nancy said, crossing the heavy plank floorway. She led the way toward the area where she had seen the trunk she thought might be hers. It was still there, but crewmen had evidently piled up some of the baggage that had fallen down. That's my trunk, all right, the girl stated. For the first time, she noticed that a net had been stretched across this part of the hole to keep the baggage in place. But the upheaval caused by the meteor had torn it to shreds. Rod said, I think we can get it out of there easily enough, he smiled. You look like a strong girl. As Nancy examined the baggage around her own piece, she suddenly found herself staring into the face of a rat. It seemed to be wedged tightly between her trunk and a heavy box. Oh! She let out a stifled scream. What's the matter? Rod Havelock asked anxiously. Nancy explained, and the assistant purser came to look at the little animal himself. We'll just let him loose, he said. The rat will be more scared of us than we are of him. He'll run off in a hurry. Reaching up, he yanked aside the trunk next to Nancy's. But the menacing rat did not scoot away as predicted. Suddenly, Nancy began to laugh. Rod, he's dead! Havelock laughed too. <laughs> the joke's on us, all right, he remarked. He lifted the rodent by the tail and flung it off to one side. Then he and Nancy set to work to loosen her trunk. By manipulating it from side to side, they were finally able to pull it forward. We'd better be careful of the box on top of it, Nancy said. We don't want to break anything. Gently, the box was shoved backward so it would not fall. Then Rod and Nancy took hold of the leather handle on each side of her trunk and eased it out. 
It was tedious work, but finally it was released. After they had carried the trunk to the door and set it down, the assistant purser said, My, this is heavy. Nancy Drew, are you sure there isn't part of a gold mine from South Africa in there? The girl laughed. No, but I bought a lot of gifts and souvenirs. She assured her companion that she was strong enough to carry the trunk with his help. He clicked off the light and locked the hold. Then he opened the door that led into the engine room and called softly to one of the men. Will you help me get this up the stairs, please? Yeah, yeah, a burly engineer replied and came over. Nancy was glad he asked no questions. The two men lugged the trunk up to the deck above. Then the engineer returned to his post. Nancy picked up one end of the trunk, and again she and Rod tiptoed along corridors until they came to cabin 128. Nancy unlocked the door, and the two carried the brass-bound piece inside and set it down. The lights were on, and Bess was seated on the side of her bed. We got it, Nancy said jubilantly. Bess showed no enthusiasm and made no comment. Instead, she cried out, I'm dreadfully worried. Nelda has disappeared. What? Nancy exclaimed in disbelief. Where? When? How? I don't know, Bess replied miserably. I had fallen asleep but heard a slight noise and woke up. I thought it was you. When I turned on the light and looked around, I discovered that Nelda was not here. Where do you suppose she went? Rod Havelock asked. Nancy and Bess had no idea. The assistant purser added practically, Wherever she's gone, I'm sure she'll be back. Then he said in a whisper, I suggest that we move the mystery trunk into the cabin next door as soon as possible and put yours under your bed, Nancy, before you have any more inquisitive visitors coming here to try to take it away from you. Nancy opened the girl's wardrobe and pulled out the little drawer in back of it. The keys were gone. Bess cried out, Someone has been here and taken Nelda away and stolen the keys. And it's all my fault for not staying awake. Nancy was alarmed. She said, I don't understand, though. If that's the case, why didn't the intruder take the mystery trunk with him? There was complete silence. Suddenly, Nancy had an idea. She walked toward the door and tried the knob. The door was not locked, and neither was the one on the other side. Quickly, Nancy stepped into cabin 130. The light was on. As she looked around, Bess and Rod walked in. All of them stared at a heap on the bed covered with a blanket. Could it be Nelda? Bess cried out, Maybe she's dead! Oh, I can't stand it! Nancy, too, was fearful that the people who had threatened Nelda had really carried out some horrible scheme. While Bess was sobbing and still blaming herself, Nancy walked over to the bed and pulled off the blanket. Nelda lay there. She did not move. She's asleep, Rod said. Are you sure? Bess sobbed. Nelda was awakened by the voices. She looked around wildly. Help! Help! she exclaimed. Nancy touched the girl gently. Nelda, wake up, please, she said. No, no, I'm awake, Nelda insisted. But some awful man who knew about my trouble back home phoned me after you left the room. Bess was asleep and didn't hear it. He said he would throw me overboard if I ever mentioned the Johannesburg incident to anyone. Oh, how awful, Bess wailed. Nelda went on. I didn't know what to do. My first thought was to run. Then I remembered this vacant cabin and decided to come here. 
I took the keys out of the little drawer and opened all the doors. But I locked the corridor door of cabin 130 and bolted it from the inside. There was no doubt that Nelda was wide awake. The others were shocked by her story. Rod Havelock was very disturbed and said, It's a fact now that you have one or more enemies aboard, Nelda. So don't ever go anywhere alone or stay in the cabin by yourself. You might be in grave danger. The girl promised to do what he said, and Nancy assured her that she and her friends would certainly protect her. Then she told how she and Rod had brought her trunk from the hold and would put the mystery trunk into the wardrobe of cabin 130. This was accomplished with the help of the two girls. Then Rod locked the connecting door from 128 to 130 and handed the girls the keys. Good night, he said, although it's really morning. He looked at his wristwatch. Only three hours of sleep for me. I'd better go. When he had left, the girls restored the keys to their hiding place in the wardrobe. Nancy's trunk was shoved under the bed, where the other one had been. Then Nelda heaved a sigh of relief. I feel so much better now. Nancy smiled. I'm glad. Let's get some sleep. I'll unpack in the morning because I'm much too weary now. As Bess and Nelda settled under the covers, Nancy began to undress. Suddenly, Bess said, I just had a horrible thought. That man who telephoned might have broken in here and thought I was Nelda. He would have thrown me overboard by mistake. Nancy tried to make light of the matter, but the words seemed to stick in her throat. She realized... It could have happened. End of chapter 7